Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today for the uh, Chittenden Central Candidate Forum. We are super lucky to have all four candidates here with us today. My name is Dan Fingus. I'm with Vermont Conservation Voters, and we are joined today with, um, along with Vermont Conservation Voters, Planned Parenthood, Vermont Action Fund, ACLU of Vermont, and VPIRG as uh, hosts of this candidate forum. And we all work together on, on questions, and we each, each organization was able to get a question in about their area of expertise. Um, our organizations are deeply involved in many different issues, including um, climate action, reproductive rights, criminal justice, democracy, and other pressing matters for Vermonters. I want to thank um, Senator Phil Baruth, Senator Martine Gullick, uh, Stuart Ledbetter, and Senator Tanya Bajofsky for joining us this evening. Um, for folks who don't know, hopefully you all know, the Central, Chittenden Central District covers Essex Junction, Winooski, and the northern neighborhoods of Burlington, including Old North End, the New North End, Downtown, Riverside, and UVM. Primary election is August 13th. Please make sure you get out and vote, whoever you're voting for. Town Meeting TV is recording this, so be on the lookout for a link from them if you want to rewatch the forum or share with your friends and family who live in the district. And with that, I'd like to introduce the moderator for tonight's candidate forum, Jessica Barquist. She is the Vice President of Public Affairs for Planned Parenthood Vermont Action Fund. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you, Dan. Okay, so we are gonna ask questions in a rotational manner with each candidate getting the opportunity to answer first, second, third, and last. And for our first few questions, we will have about two minutes each, and Dan is gonna help us out right here with our 30 second, 10 second, and ending cue cards. And I will um, jump in and ask candidates who run long to end their answer. So let's get started right away. Let's start by getting to know each of our candidates a little bit better. So please introduce yourself to our audience in two minutes, starting with you, Senator Baruth, and then we'll go to Senator Gulick and down the line. Good evening, everybody. I'm Phil Baruth. Uh, believe it or not, this is my eighth election. I first ran in 2010 and ran for the Senate, unexpectedly won. Uh, and since that time, I've done just about everything in the Senate. I currently serve as Senate President Pro Tem, and one of the things that I've been doing there is trying to manage a, an incredible generational turnover in the Senate. So, not sure if you've heard, but we have lost a couple of senators who have recently died, Senator Dick Mazza, Senator Dick Sears, and then we've had four retire, uh, longtime great people, but that's given us a new infusion of enthusiasm, new blood, new perspective, all very much to the good. Speaking of which, I just want to brag on my two colleagues for a moment, Senator Vihovsky and Senator Larock Gulick. Um, Tanya has been somebody who, coming from the social services world as a clinical social worker, she's brought real skill in that area of policy. Martine in the educational realm, um, you'll hear more about that. But they are an example of what I'm talking about, which is a new Senate, really. And it's been one of the joys of my life seeing that come together and come together very quickly because the voters sent us very, very experienced and uh, competent people. So um, thank you for doing that. Thank you for sending me back for the last 14 years, and um, I hope to have a chance to tell you more about what I've tried to do in that time. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Martine Larock Gulick, and I am one of your state senators. I'm also a school commissioner here in Burlington. Um, I just want to say thank you to everyone for coming out today. I recognize some of you from the neighborhood. I recognize some of you for um, from your incredible advocacy around pollinators, um, democracy, and a variety of other um, important issues that we're facing today. Um, I want to give a little shout out to the pro tem to my right. Um, I don't think it was easy the last two years corralling the new guard as with, the, with the old guard, so to speak. And I know it was at times um, not easy, and I just want to thank him for his, his great work. 
much appreciated. Um, so I grew up around here in South Burlington. I'm a proud graduate of Vermont Public Schools, and I am now in the Senate serving on the Education Committee. I'm vice chair and also um, on the Health and Welfare Committee. And I'm really proud of the work that we've done the last two years. I know we're gonna get into that a little bit later, um, but we did a lot of really wonderful work around literacy, around protecting libraries, around making it hard to ban books in our schools. Um, and so I, I'm just really, really excited to talk about some of our work today. Um, what else? I speak French. My mom is French Canadian. I like to say that I grew up, um, you know, on the other side of Lime Kiln Bridge. So Winooski was kind of my backyard. I taught in Essex for close to 30 years, and obviously um, I've lived in Burlington for um, over 30 years now. So I'm thrilled to be here, and thanks again. And I will pass the baton. Thanks, Martine, um, and bienvenue. Uh, I'm Stuart Ledbetter. Uh, thanks to our sponsors for putting this together. This is our first forum of this uh, primary season. Um, for those who don't know, I'm running this year after retiring in February from uh, a very long uh, and I think successful career in broadcast news and political journalism in Vermont. Um, I've spent four decades traveling uh, all over this state to every community in this state, uh, in most cases many, many times. Um, for uh, happy occasions and, uh, and sad ones. I can tell you that um, you get to know um, a state really well uh, when, you've done it, uh, when you've done that for as long as I have. There are just uh, experiences that are searing when you talk to Vermonters about um, uh, you know, the flood that has just ravaged their home or business. Uh, they're they're shell-shocked. Sometimes they've lost a, a home to fire or a child to uh, an overdose. Uh, or maybe worse yet, when you have to knock on the door of someone whose son or daughter has been killed uh, in war. Uh, you, if you don't have it already, you feel an overpowering sense of empathy that does not leave you. Um, I'm a Democrat. I have voted in every Democratic primary uh, for as long as I can remember. Um, I'm LGBTQ. Uh, I am a mainstream kind of guy. Uh, I am pro-economy, pro-progress. Uh, and as you'll hear tonight, um, I favor uh, the issues that I think the sponsors here care most about. I grew up in southern Vermont, like many, went to UVM. Uh, my first apartment was right around the corner here on North Winooski Avenue. I saw it coming over here tonight. I favor things like universal health care, uh, big time, common sense gun reform, uh, the overdose prevention site in downtown Burlington, uh, full court press on housing. I can't stand toxic politics. I'll do whatever I can to avoid that uh, taking hold in Montpelier. Uh, I look forward to our conversation very much here tonight. Um, I'm Tanya Vihovsky, and I grew up in a single parent working class home in Vermont. I graduated from Essex High School, and what I came to realize is that the systems weren't set up to work for me, and that government wasn't a place that I saw myself represented. When I came back from college, being able to live here was unaffordable, and so I commuted from Montpelier to my job in Burlington. And at a certain point, I came to the point where I realized I either had to leave or I had to do something to make Vermont more affordable and more accessible to people and family like, like mine. So I ran for office because I felt like my voice mattered and my representation mattered. I was told by a senior senator from Vermont that the fact that I didn't see myself represented in Montpelier was the reason I had to run, not the reason not to. I'm one of two renters in the Senate because I can't afford to buy in Vermont. I am personally impacted by the issues that are affecting most Vermonters every day. And what I've come to know is that those closest to the problems often are best poised to find the solutions to those problems and have the least access to power. I've spent my time in the Senate and in the House before that fighting for these everyday people, bringing my own experience and making sure the voices of the most impacted have a seat at the table. And I still find myself every day in committee asking questions that nobody else considered because that's not their life experience. And this is why representation matters. I serve 
serve as vice chair on the Government Operations Committee where I have fought for expanding democracy, expanding voter access, expanding municipal police oversight, and really making sure that everyone, regardless of their income, has a seat at the table. I also serve on the Judiciary Committee where I have brought my voice as a social worker to the issues of the judiciary because oftentimes we look at issues of crime as statistics or as the harm to community, but we forget that these are social issues. These are people who have been failed by our systems. And I was recently named to the Tenant Landlord Law Advisory Committee, and I'm really excited to bring my voice as a tenant to that space. And I'm glad that there was a tenant in the Senate to be put on that committee. So that is what I am bringing to the table, and I look forward to talking with you all. Wonderful, thank you all. We're gonna get right into it with our first question. This past year, the legislature passed major environmental legislation, including modernizing the renewable energy standard, creating a first in the nation climate super fund, responding to the devastating floods of 2023 with the Flood Safety Act, modernizing Act 250 to prioritize both conservation and making it easier to build housing in population centers and downtowns. Please reflect on those bills and tell us what your climate priorities are moving forward. And this time we'll start with Senator Gulick. Thank you so much, Jessica. I just want to start by acknowledging that um, we are at, the, at a milestone where we are um, acknowledging the flooding that devastated our state a year ago. Um, and I think from what I'm seeing on the weather app, we are about to um, experience another significant rainfall. So we cannot drag our feet when it comes to climate change. We need to act, we need to act decisively, we need to act now, um, and that requires investment. I did wanna start by um, you know, acknowledging the legislature and the work that we did around Act 250 reform. This was a veto and we did override this veto. I think um, it was, you know, it's taken so long to actually do anything with Act 250 that we should celebrate the fact that we not only are going to allow municipalities, towns and cities to develop in a smart manner, but we are also going to protect green spaces. We are going to protect wildlife corridors. Um, and this was all, this was very important. I think um, part of the Vermont brand is the fact that we have beautiful landscapes, we have trees, we have green hillsides that are not developed, and it's important for us to maintain that. Um, I want to also celebrate the um, H706, which was the neonicotinoid bill, um, which is really going to protect our pollinators over time. Um, this was around the seed coating that was harmful to, to pollinators, um, and many countries in the world are already banning this substance, so I'm really excited that we finally got on board. Um, lastly, I just want to acknowledge again from my education lens that I think it's so important that we start thinking about investing in green jobs, in technology, in innovation, and that we invest in students, especially in terms of technical education. This is something that we, we have to focus on. Thank you. Thanks. Um, there's no question that uh, over the last uh, two or four years, the legislature has done a great deal um, in terms of climate, setting in motion a series of uh, pretty bold initiatives, one of which will come back to before the legislature for what they call a recheck in the um, upcoming biennium. Uh, it's the Affordable Heat Act, and um, the, the rules are being written now. Um, we don't have them yet and don't know exactly how it will look, so that will be a big, a big priority for the, uh, for the next legislature. Um, assuming that it uh, is equitable and, and doesn't slam low and moderate income Vermonters, I'm all in. Um, this is the law. The Global Warming uh, Solutions Act passed uh, years ago sets in motion a, a, an official state policy that we are now going to have to step up and meet in the years ahead. Um, one thing the legislature was unable to do this year is expand Vermont's 50-year-old bottle deposit law. Um, that's an environmental policy. Uh, it uh, helps to uh, reduce waste at the roadside. Uh, and expands the bottle deposit law that's been around for, you know, since I was a kid. Um, and I've never really understood why it hasn't expanded as beverages have changed. Uh, another priority, I, I don't have a boat, which I did, but I rely on others to take me out on Lake Champlain. And, you know, if, if you've been in this area for a long time, you cannot help but notice 
that some summers, um, it's tough to find a spot where you really want to jump into the lake. Climate change and frequently intense storms have sent a tremendous amount of foreign material into tributaries and out into Lake Champlain. Uh, phosphorus remains a big problem. If you've never been to Lake Carmi, every Vermonter should go. It's appalling uh, some summers. Uh, the legislature is going to have to address this uh, going forward. Those are a couple of priorities as it relates to the environment. Climate change is here. We know that. We saw that last year. We're going to see it again. And we're currently not on track to meet the Global Warming Solutions Act targets. We did amazing work this year, with but we need to focus on both mitigation and resiliency. We need to stop investing in fossil fuel infrastructure. We need to build out 100% green in-state renewable energy and not continue relying on Hydro-Quebec. And we need to follow through with the bill that we passed this year to make big oil pay for their contribution to the climate catastrophe. And we need to decrease impervious surfaces in order to help protect our waterways. In our flood bill this year, we did some really great resiliency work, making sure that we had a resiliency fund stood up and that we had county disaster response and floodplain mitigation. But whatever we're doing, we need to ground it in climate justice. We need to make sure that our lowest income housing is not built in floodplains and the mobile homes that are often built there are moved. We need to make sure that those mobile home standards are up to par for the increasing severity of storms so that our lowest income Vermonters are not continuing to be further more more harmed than other people. And we need to make sure that everyone is housed. And before, it, while we get to housing everyone, we need to make sure that we update our emergency housing policy so that it doesn't focus on a Vermont that was, where cold was the only danger, and focuses on the Vermont climate that is, where heat, bad air quality, flooding are all dangers to our unhoused Vermonters. And we need to move away from a reimbursement only model for people investing in green upgrades to their homes and vehicles. The people who most need these cost saving and energy saving tools cannot wait months to get a reimbursement on a more expensive tool Call, be it a car or an air pump, they need that investment now. And that will drive down cost for them, but they can't put the upfront cost up. So we really need to focus our policy on investing in the people who are both most harmed and least able to respond to the climate catastrophe. Okay. Um, so Vermont conservation voters, I, I did a little uh, webinar with them. And they were calling the last two years the best biennium for the environment in recent memory. And I was uh, a little taken aback by the level of that praise, but we talked about it for a half an hour, and I actually believe it's true. So it's not just the pollinator bill. We also did work on PFAS, forever chemicals, keeping those out of Vermont. Um, we also did S213, which was the Flood Safety Act, which has in it any number of environmental measures designed not just to protect humans, but to protect the environment as we go into a climate change influenced environment. Beyond that, the Act 250 bill, which modernizes Act 250 to allow us to build where we want to build and need to build, but also strengthens conservation measures elsewhere in sensitive areas of the state. That's something that Vermont conservation voters was very excited about because it includes, among other things, the road rule. In other words, you can't build 2,000 feet of driveway off a main road into the forest because once you do that, once you fragment the forest that way, it continues to fragment, the environment gets degraded, the habitat gets degraded, and we're in a bad place. So that particular bill, the Act 250 Modernization Bill, was a balance between uh, what the development interests wanted and needed and what the conservation community wanted and needed. The Chamber of Commerce called it historic. Vermont conservation voters called it historic. That tells you right there, we caught the unicorn. Uh, we got the bill that people have been trying for five years or 10 years to get. Thank you. We're going to move on to our second question, and we're going to start with Mr. Ledbetter. Vermont's prison system has some of the worst racial disparities in the country, incarcerating black people at more than seven times the rate of white people. What policies would you propose to address this systemic racism and eliminate the racial disparities that exist in our criminal legal system? 
Well, thanks for that. I, I can tell you that um, in my years in journalism, I uh, met a number of African-American uh, citizens, uh, often women, who talked about how they felt targeted by local police in different communities in our state, uh, who were doing nothing wrong but driving to or from work and who were pulled over. I have reported on the statistical analysis by Stephanie Seguino and others at UVM and at Cornell uh, that seems to confirm uh, that we have racial bias in our, in our law enforcement, and we have had for, for some time. Uh, there must be accountability in our law enforcement. Uh, there must be, um, you know, sort of colorblind treatment, if that's not an old-fashioned term, in our, in our criminal justice system. The Attorney General has a panel uh, at, uh, within her office that um, is charged with recommending to the legislature policies that will uh, improve our, um, our systems, uh, and make recommendations to prosecutors and defense attorneys and to, to judges uh, so that we make progress here. It's absolutely abhorrent uh, that uh, people of color are treated differently simply because of the color of their skin. Now, if 10 people named Frank commit a murder, well, then you'd understand why there would be 10 people named Frank behind bars. But if it's because of racial injustice or bias, that's absolutely abhorrent uh, to me and to everyone else. Uh, so we would lean into the panel that is, that whose job it is uh, to, uh, to reduce this problem going forward. It's obviously uh, intolerable in our state. Thank you. Sitting on the Judiciary Committee, it is absolutely clear to me that racial disparity exists at every level of our criminal justice system with police stops, with disparate charging, disparate sentencing, and an all overall over-representation of people of color in our criminal justice system. And this starts in our school system with our prison to our school to prison pipeline, and it travels throughout our society. We need to look at completely revamping our criminal justice system. And one bill that I introduced this year that didn't get off the wall, but I hope will if I am back, would have in made that every law that we make, any new crime, any change to a crime, any change to a sentence would have to be put through, evaluated through the lens of its racial impact and whether or not it would decrease or increase the racial injustice in the, in the carceral system. We also need to look towards secondary enforcement for non-public safety traffic stops. There's no need to pull someone over. If they have a broken taillight, you can mail them a notice. Traffic stops are the most dangerous stops for police and for the occupants of a vehicle, and they are one of the first places where we see racial dis Disparity. Stops like brake lights are where officers then disproportionately search the vehicles of people of color in spite of the fact that they are less likely to have contraband in their cars. We need to look at decarcerating things like second look legislation. So people who have been given long sentence, perhaps disparate long sentences, at a certain point can have their sentence reevaluated for its fairness and appropriateness. And we need to make sure we're providing racially informed housing, mental health care, and substance use care for anyone who's leaving the carceral system. And there is, there's so much more that we need to do, but it starts by actually unpacking the system and looking at every point along the way where it is racially disparate. And I have significant concerns that the, the avenue that the legislature is moving towards is actually backwards, not forwards. At one point, we were having conversations about ending no-knock warrants and ending qualified immunity. And instead, this year, we were increasing penalties for crimes. And so I want to go back and right the ship and keep moving forward. Thank you, Senator. <laughs> That's okay. So uh, to pick up on a point that Tanya made, when he was in the Senate, Tim Ash was always very eloquent on the need to not have primary seatbelt enforcement. And what that meant is that a police, the way it stands now, police cannot pull you over for not wearing your seatbelt alone. They have to have some other primary reason. And then if they pull you over for that and you're not wearing your seatbelt, then you can be given a ticket. The reason why Tim insisted on that and the House wanted to change it so that you could have primary seatbelt enforcement was that he felt it would be, based on data that he had seen, it would be used inordinately against drivers of color um, so that police would make a kind of subconscious decision. Well, I'll pull this over, person over for not wearing a seatbelt. So that's the level I think that Tanya is talking about. Every single bill that goes through judiciary or the Senate really has these kind of racial ramifications. 
So um, I'll give you another one. It became clear that in spite of a law calling for uh, law enforcement agencies to report traffic stop data, many were not doing it. And so I was working at that time with Mark Hughes, and he had this idea that the state should withhold grants from law enforcement agencies who hadn't put forward their data. And it seemed like a great idea to me. We put it in, we passed that law, and we now have data not from everybody, but just about everybody, just about every time they're supposed to report it. So there's been a big improvement in that. But it takes a law where there's a carrot and a stick. And um, so that's an example of the stick. The other thing is we've tried to eliminate as many surcharges that go along with low-level crimes as possible because those surcharges add up and they keep people in prison for much longer than they would otherwise be. And that's often disproportionately people of color. Thanks. Thank you. When I taught high school, I often found that my students were really hungry to understand the world and they were really hungry to understand why things are the way they are why some people seem to have um, privilege just cast upon them and others don't. Um, so it was frustrating as I was um, wrapping up my teaching career to have folks talking about critical race theory and things like that. So, um, you know, again, I have to bring up uh, education, the importance of teaching history in an accurate and a, a real manner is super important to everything that we do in our society because our history taints all that we do. Um, I want to bring up, get a little bit more focused and talk a little bit about some of the um, legislation that we passed over these past two years. Um, there was a restorative justice bill, age 645, that went through. Um, this is something we all know that restorative justice is incredibly helpful to um, keeping folks out of the court system and keeping folks from going directly to jail. It's a way for um, victims and um, perpetrators to meet face to face and solve problems. And from what I hear, it's extremely um, successful. I also, um, one of the things I love about being a senator is working with my constituents. And I had some folks come to me last summer and say, on North Avenue, we have folks who are literally drag racing. It's incredibly dangerous for our kids. They said, what can we do about this? I put in a bill for ATLEs, which are basically automated traffic um, law enforcement, so that we could address the danger of speeding on our Burlington streets while also avoiding traffic stops. Um, it did go through, it went through as a one-year pilot, but I'm hoping that we can continue to flesh that out in the future. Um, and also, I'm gonna talk a little bit again later, hopefully, about judicial retention, which is important as well. Thank you. We are gonna move on to our next topic, and this time we will start with Senator Vyhovsky. Abortion and reproductive liberty are constitutionally protected rights for Vermonters. However, there are ongoing attacks at the federal level, including attacks on access to contraception, medication abortion, gender-affirming care, IVF, and even emergency services. If we were to see a federal abortion ban, Vermont would also see that right taken away. Given that, and the ongoing financial hardships of our providers following COVID and the stagnant Medicaid reimbursements in our state, how will you advocate for increased investment and protections in sexual and reproductive health care, including abortion? What else do you think is needed to strengthen or maintain abortion rights in our state? As you say, Vermont has led the way in the nation with constitutional protections for reproductive rights and laws protecting abortions. And in this past biennium, Senator Gulick and her Committee on Health Care worked hard to protect providers who are offering this care. Um, and we need to make sure that this care is affordable so that all people, regardless of their income, are able to access it. And we need to make sure that we have the phys physicians and nurses available to provide the care as we have a ex an exodus of primary care physicians and reproductive care physicians due to low wages and high costs of living. So we need to invest in that education and in paying our providers enough to be here. And we need to secure funding for our organizations like Planned Parenthood that provide this care at low or no cost to Vermonters. We also need to ensure that we are enshrining in law the right to gender-affirming care 
that that is explicitly protected for all, again, regardless of income and regardless of age. And we need, when we talk about reproductive care, I think it's also really important that we're talking about coverage for, in, for IVF and fertility treatment as well, as this is also reproductive health care and presently care that many insurers do not cover or cover very little. And I know Medicaid does not cover at all. And so we, are, we can't just protect the right of someone to live as they are in their whole identity or to end a pregnancy. We need to protect the right of people, regardless of income, to have a child. And that is, of course, investing in these services and investing in Medicaid coverage for um, IVF and fertility services, but it's also making sure that people can afford to raise those children in our communities. One of the things I worked on this year was a bill that would protect um, sexual assault survivors from being held accountable in any way for their assault in civil court. And that passed thanks to the amazing advocacy work of a young man from Milton who brought that to me because it happened to him. He had a court look at him and say, you're 40% responsible for your assault. And we passed a bill that ended that practice in Vermont. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. You're really far away. <laughs> um, I just want to give a shout out to our Congresswoman, Becca Ballant. So when Becca was uh, the Senate President Pro Tem, she brought forward, along with the Health and Welfare Committee, um, the change to the Constitution that we took proactively in the Senate and the House um, and sent to the voters so that we will enshrine in our Constitution our reproductive liberties. And that was um, groundbreaking. Other states, I think, have looked to us for that kind of leadership. And, um, and Becca provided that. She is also on the ballot, by the way, uh, if anybody's interested in my endorsement for uh, Congress. Um, the other thing that I would say is that uh, in terms of what Tanya was talking about, shortages of medical care, that's where I really feel like we are um, losing a race in Vermont. We are losing not just OBGYN and nurses who, who might otherwise uh, be in this area, obstetricians, um, but we are losing our healthcare system itself. So right now there's a community-wide discussion going on being conducted by the Green Mountain Care Board. And they're out in communities, they will be in Burlington, they are out uh, in the Northeast Kingdom today, I believe, and all of these discussions are meant to lead to a revamp of our entire hospital system because it is like other systems in the state beginning to crumble under the, you know, the weight of double-digit increases in healthcare costs and inflation. So that's something writ large. Then the other thing I will just say is this Supreme Court is clearly looking at uh, a, a theory of fetal personhood. If they do that, it will supersede our state constitution and then all bets are off. We're in something like The Handmaid's Tale, unfortunately. Thank you. I will deliver the good news first and then the not so good news afterward. Um, I wanna start by um, recognizing two women that I served with on the Health and Welfare Committee, Senators Ruth Hardy and Senators Virginia Lyons. They worked really hard on a bill that became law, S-37. Senator Vyhovsky already mentioned that it protects uh, professionals um, and allows them to do their jobs um, with uh, gender-affirming health care and reproductive uh, services. It also um, is important because it requires that health insurance plans um, and Medicaid cover gender-affirming care as well as abortion-related services. Um, it prohibits a healthcare provider from being subject pr to professional disciplinary action. And one thing that it did that was super helpful, that I think will be helpful, is that it set some unprofessional conduct standards. What this means is, is it pro prohibits false and misleading advertising about services at limited services pregnancy centers. Pregnancy centers often draw folks in claim that they're gonna provide actual health care, but then don't deliver on that. It is a disturbing um, practice. Um, I also just wanted to say that I um, was the author of a bill, S109, which was the doula bill, which is going to um, require that Medicaid, hopefully we're getting there. It's a first step in um, having Medicaid um, pay for doula services for our most um, 
disadvantaged folks who really need that kind of um, support in the postpartum um, period as well as during pregnancy and labor. Um, and lastly, um, the limiting of prior authorizations is going to allow us to really hold on to our primary care providers and let them do their work, which is so critical to our state. Here, here. We are in a primary care crisis uh, in our state and uh, high hopes. You know, there's not a lot to add. I don't disagree with anything that uh, my three colleagues here have said. Um, I think Vermont um, should be commended. Uh, I think our legislature and the voters of Vermont should be commended for being willing to overwhelmingly um, adopt a constitutional amendment to our state constitution, uh, the Reproductive Liberty Amendment. Uh, you know, as, as, uh, as has been said, you know, we are in a new environment in Washington with uh, what's been called the MAGA Supreme Court. Um, as long as you have Clarence Thomas, on that court, he is uh, looking to reconsider, that's, I think, the word, um, all sorts of Supreme Court precedents. And, uh, and <laughs> it's, it's hard to know where this is all going. But I would, I would uh, certainly add that um, I support gender-affirming care. And I think that we should add an LGBTQ amendment to our state constitution as well. I think um, in light of all the uncertainty in Washington, that our gay and lesbian, uh, bisexual and transgender Vermonters need the full protection of our, of our state constitution and our medical system, and I will absolutely champion that cause. Thank you. Vermont has the lowest electricity rates and bills in New England because we have been prioritizing renewables and energy efficiency for 25 years. It's a huge success story. The legislature is now working to do the same efficiency and renewable work in the heating sector, but the fossil fuel industry are attacking them for it. The fossil fuel industry wants to keep things the way they are, no matter how much it costs Vermonters or damages the environment. What do you say to opponents of climate action in the face of the evidence that moving away from fossil fuels is good for Vermont's economy and environment? And will you vote to reauthorize the Affordable Heat Act? Senator Bruth. Uh, absolutely. And let me just tell you a quick story about S5, which was the clean heat standard, as we called it. So as that was going through, um, the lobbyists for the fossil fuel dealers were using every questionable tactic and unethical tactic that they could. Among other things, they were putting little notices in people's heating bill saying that Democrats in the legislature are going to charge you $1,200 a year if S5 passes. It was a completely made up number, but it was there in big scary print, and it made our jobs in terms of passing and overriding the governor's veto very, very hard. So we wound up with 20 votes exactly, and uh, that cost me probably five years off my life and put half of my gray hair in. The only way to get it through, and Stuart mentioned this before, was to add what we called the check back, which means this coming biennium, another bill is going to have to be approved, the governor will veto it, and we will have to override. So I'm delighted that the question is being asked, because I need to be able to count on a complete Chittenden delegation that is 100% behind the clean heat standard. So. As Stuart said, it will come back with more meat on the bone. We will have numbers to crunch. We'll have rules to actually read and evaluate. But it will have to go through the entire process again. Uh, that was the only way to get it through. So we, we took the only path available to us. But unfortunately, it added two or three years to the life until we get that bill into place. So um, it was a delay, but a necessary one and I hope to end that delay this next biennium. I'm going to be the problem student and go a little bit off script because I didn't get to finish what I wanted to say last time. Um, I gave you the good news about the bill that we passed in health and welfare, and I never got to speak about my disappointment, which was that we didn't pass the data privacy bill. One of the things that the data privacy bill would have done would have put restrictions on selling data around geofencing. And if you know what geofencing is, um, there are 
organizations that can track your whereabouts, including going to a health clinic or a, um, you know, a reproductive center, reproductive health care center, um, so that it was unfortunate that we weren't able to put some boundaries and barriers on that practice, but perhaps in the future we will get there. Um, yes, I support the um, renewable, the Affordable Heat Act, and yes, I will support it moving forward. Um, just to follow up on what Senator Baruth said, there was some misinformation or disinformation around um, oil prices and, and prices of various um, heating options in the state, which are actually very volatile. So when there were prices going up, it wasn't something that was attributed to the Affordable Heat Act. It was, a, it was attributed to the fact that this is a volatile um, substance that you know, prices will go up and down. So unfortunately, um, you know, we, it, there was a manipulation of fact there, and it was, it was too bad. I 100% uh, support looking into and, and moving forward with renewables. I know it's hard for people. It's change. Um, it's an uncertain future, but we need to embrace the technologies that come with clean energy, and, and that is an investment that will pay dividends in the future. Uh, agree. As long as we don't throw low and moderate income Vermonters, uh, you know, under the bus, so to speak. Uh, as Senator Baruth mentioned, the, the rules and the costs are, as yet, today, unknown. We will know before the uh, start of the new session, and um, I have every confidence that, that uh, the Public Utilities Commission will We'll get it right, uh, and there will be another vote, and I will be in support of it. When that day comes, Senator Baruth, you need not worry. Uh, we have to get these new renewable energy and clean heat technologies into the hands of every Vermonter. But the truth is that not every Vermonter has got uh, a lot of cash lying around to, uh, to make the shift. This, this uh, clean heat standard will, over time, disincentivize continued use of fossil fuels uh, and incentivize the shift toward uh, cleaner sources of energy. Uh, that is our state policy. I totally support it. I just want to make sure that our, uh, the folks who don't have uh, the money to make the change, I don't worry about the, the wealthy people, but the folks on the low end of the spectrum, that they can afford to make this transition along with the rest of us. So. I just want to clarify, the clean heat standard was a bill from the previous biennium, and the Affordable Heat Act was its new and better version, because I am part of what probably added at least a few of those gray hairs to Senator Baruth's head, in that as the clean heat standard came out, I believe four years ago, I didn't think it, would, it was equitable enough. I didn't think equity was defined well enough. I didn't think the income levels were defined well enough. However, the affordable heat standard did a much better job at that. And I was able to work with the committee around my concerns about ensuring that renters weren't left out, my concerns ensuring that we defined what low and moderate income meant in a way that was responsive to the cost of living in Vermont and not reliant on federal statistics that are not relevant here and haven't been updated in 30 plus years. I was able to work really closely with that committee to make that the affordable heat standard, while not perfect, because nothing this complex when you're working with 20 people with different opinions is going to be perfect, was good enough to know that we were moving forward without leaving people behind. Is there work to continue to do to make sure that we are not overusing biomass that's doing damage to our environment? Is there work continued to do to make sure that the biofuels that are in the bill are slowly being weaned down and aren't harming countries in other places of the world? We're not clear cutting Costa Rica to fuel Vermont in, with cleaner fuels, yes, there's still work to do. And some of those pieces were put into this bill because I advocated that it needed to be better. And so I think that this is a really important step forward and there's more work to do, as is always going to be the case when we are transforming a system from what has been for decades to what we know we need for the future. Thank you. Governor Phil Scott has used the most vetoes of any governor in Vermont's history. 
and vetoed eight major bills again this year, including important environmental, land use, and addiction treatment bills. Most of those bills were then overridden in the House and Senate, many times with tripartisan support. In addition, the governor has also shown he is willing to ignore the advise and consent function of the Senate in his reappointment of the acting secretary of education. As a senator, how will you approach working with a governor who continuously disregards the role of the legislature and its elected representatives and senators from across Vermont? We're starting with Senator Gulick. Thank you, yes, we figured that out after a while. Um, so, uh, first of all, we are facing monumental problems as a, as a world and as a little small state of Vermont. So it's time that we come together and work on problems together. Um, not showing up to critical meetings about um, school finance, for example, is just not acceptable. We absolutely all have to come to the table and work together. Um, Regarding um, about the you know checks and balances of the three branches of government, absolutely critical. We are there to check each other and check each other's power. That is so important. I was on the education committee. I was one of the folks who got to interview the uh, current interim secretary of education. Um, having spent 30 years in education, I felt that I had a good lens on what we needed um, in that position, and I found the candidate wanting in, ver in many, many areas, including experience and just general understanding of ed policy. Um, so I voted no to that um, uh, appointment, and I also spoke um, as sort of a rebuttal on the Senate floor for um, my vote. Um, I think my colleague, Senator Vyhovsky, will go into a little bit more on, on an aspect that she has been working on, but I did just want to say that I've had many of my constituents ask me, well, how did that candidate get to where she was? Why was she sent forward to the governor? It's because the State Board of Education is a board that is made up solely of governor appointees. I wrote a bill that would have allowed the Senate and the House to also have a hand in appointments to the State Board of Education. It never got off the wall in my committee. But that's the kind of work that we need to do to make sure that there is adequate balance of power in various parts of our government. I'm gonna bring that bill back if I'm reelected. It's really important. Thank you. The, the separation, uh, the distance between the Scott administration and the legislature, it, it's a huge divide. I mean. I've been covering uh, Montpelier uh, for four decades, intensively for the last uh, 20 state house sessions. Governors of both parties, um, houses and uh, legislatures of, of differing parties at different times in our history. I haven't seen this degree of dysfunction or disconnect, is maybe the better word, um, in, in my many years in Vermont. Uh, Senator Vyhovsky led uh, the charge to sue the governor over the appointment of an interim education secretary. And I think it's a pretty good constitutional question. Um, I think we should know the answer. Uh, it should be clear. Uh, and that's what the judiciary is for. We have three branches of government. Legislature has been trying to solve some pretty, pretty difficult problems uh, in recent years. Uh, the governor, who is uh, very popular in our state, he's the most, uh, the, you know, he. <laughs> Polling consistently shows that he has a higher favorable ratio than governors in any other state. I mean, that's just the fact. So how do you get along? Well, you have to get along. It's just not good enough to retreat to your respective corners and say, well, I can't deal with him. I mean, I can, you know, they're unreasonable. I can't talk with them. Well, I mean, that is what you get paid to do. Maybe I'm being naive, but I will try my damnedest to uh, reach some consensus in Montpelier and, and help reduce the level of, of tension um, and see if we can't forge at least some greater compromise on some of these big issues that really require buy-in from across our state. 
So first I want to make a plug for universal civics education because I find myself doing this little bit a lot and that is that there are three separate but equal branches of government and that is because our founding fathers, flawed as they may have been, knew that any branch having all of the power was dangerous. And those branches have a statutory and constitutional obligation to uphold certain duties and certain jobs to hold the other branches to account. However, when we have one branch that is unwilling to follow that, it is up to the other branch to check that, which is, yes, I did file a lawsuit because I felt like it was a violation of separation of powers for the governor to ignore the statutory requirement of the Senate's advice and consent on an appointment. And it's a challenging thing to do as a working class social worker who is left to fund a lawsuit by myself against the entire arm of the state. But what I have shown, I think, time and time again, is that I, when, I, when what I think is right is what is on the line, I'm going to stand up even when it's hard. We have that statutory obligation. And yes, the governor has a right to veto things. And I think we built an immense amount of consensus in the General Assembly in that we were able to override seven of those eight vetoes. We all need to come to the table. And what I have seen in my four years in first in the House and then in the Senate is year after year, the unwillingness to come to the table grows. And we can't compromise with someone who's unwilling to come to the table, and so we do the best work that we can do. And what I've seen in the Senate, what we'll talk about the Senate because that's where I am, is incredible willingness to come together and innovate and compromise and figure out how we thread the needle in spite of the fact that one of our partners is unwilling to come to the table. And to me, that shows a just incredible amount of fortitude and, and foresight to do what's best for Vermonters. Um, it's funny, you know, I, I watch the media pretty carefully, and one of the things that always amazes me is when Phil Scott was vetoing a record number of bills every year that he was in office, literally a record number of bills, nobody really had a problem in the media with that. It was kind of like, well, you know, he's sort of telling the legislature where to stop, and he's, he's reining them in somehow. But when people got frustrated, and wanted childcare, wanted responses on climate change, wanted chemicals like PFAS and neonicotinoids to be banned, they sent more and more Democrats to Montpelier. And now we do have enough in those cases with those kind of pressing issues to override the governor. And now the media has this different attitude, which is there's something odd and sort of suspicious about how many seats the Democrats have. Shouldn't they compromise, even though they have enough to override? Shouldn't they voluntarily sit down with the governor and give him what he wants? Now, that's not something that they ever said when he had the upper hand. Now it turns out that in some cases, like childcare, we can override, but we're asked to sort of unilaterally do what the governor preferred, which was to spend about a third the amount of money that it would take to impact childcare in any significant way. So we said, we're not willing to do that. We want a full infusion into the childcare sector. We want PFAS banned. We want neonicotinoids banned. We want a modernization of Act 250. All of the vetoes that he otherwise would have had sustained. So the way I look at it is the final check in the framers' vision is the check on the governor because they had had a king and they were suspicious of executive power. So the final check is two-thirds of the House and the Senate, that is, two-thirds of the state of Vermont saying, this has to go through. Thank you. Our final question before we'll move on to our closing statements tonight. On the federal level, we see continued attacks on our democracy from the January 6th insurrection and Supreme Court decisions as recently as last week. What is Vermont's role in strengthening our democracy, and what further legislation can we pass to ensure that Vermonters have their right to vote easily, accessible, and protected? And we'll start with Mr. Ledbetter. Well, this is, you know, when you've been in journalism all your life, this is kind of a no-brainer. Um, what we do is, every day, is try to protect democracy a little bit. We have a state that I'm very proud to say makes it easier to vote than maybe any other. Uh, we allow 
Uh, some communities in our state allow those who are not yet citizens to participate in local elections. Uh, we protect um, and defend uh, cameras uh, in courts, access to public meetings, open meeting law. We try to expose malfeasance and uh, shine a light. Uh, yet as they say, you know, sunshine um, is the best disinfectant. Uh, not always popular. Uh, that's what I tried to do uh, for four decades. And so you will not be surprised that protecting democracy is near and dear to me. Uh, what we see in Washington um, is dangerous. Uh, perhaps we could expand automatic ballots. Uh, we were talking, Senator Vyhovsky and I were talking uh, earlier about uh, for the primary, um, where you automatically get one mailed to you, as you do with other elections. Um, I, but I think we have an awful lot to be proud of in our state. Uh, unfortunately, we do not control uh, the Supreme Court and what the Congress will do, God help us, um, depending upon how it goes this November. So um, I guess those would be some general thoughts about protecting democracy. No surprise, all in favor. As you point out, now more than ever, we have to do everything we can in Vermont to fight for protecting our democracy, and there are some obvious ways to do that. So uh, with the passing of the voter expansion and general, um, universal mail voting bill, Vermont moved from 23rd most accessible state to third most accessible state by the Covey um, voter access study. Two things we could do would be to fully expand automatic voter registration and allow 16-year-olds to register ahead of elections so that they would automatically become eligible the moment they turned 18. And that would probably move us to two. I've, I'm still looking with the Secretary of State at what would be the other small tweaks to get us to number one. And it is my goal that in our next election cycle, Vermont is number one for voter access. We also need to look at accountability. And we, we do have some municipal and state ethics codes, but we need to really put teeth on those and really make sure that they're enforced and that our local and state bodies are fully transparent and held accountable to their voters. And we need to do democracy expanding voter think, um, tools like passing ranked choice voting. Um, some less obvious things are making sure that we have strong public education system, because without a public education system, our democracy dies. We need to make sure that people have economic access, and we have expansive campaign finance reform so that some va vo voices with more money don't matter more than those who don't have as much money. We need to make sure, and frankly, we need to pay our legislators livable wages so that representation in the state house is available to everyone and not just those who can afford to be there. Everyone has to be able to fully participate and have all of their needs met or our democracy crumbles. So the Washington Post has a slogan, democracy dies in darkness. And what that means to me is that the media landscape is extremely important wherever you live, especially the local landscape. When I ran the first time 14 years ago, the free press was the number one outlet where people got their news, was the number one place where you wanted to have your ads. Everybody looked at it every day. It is now sadly gone from the media landscape. It's still there in some nominal way, but they don't do news, they don't do politics, they don't educate people in these issues. So local news, local coverage, local television, that is key. So right now we're being recorded by Channel 17. Lauren Glenn Davidian, uh, I sat down with prior to this uh, past session, and she and I talked about this very thing and I put in a bill which resulted ultimately in a million dollars in ongoing funding for public television. And that is something that is not a one time, that's every year going forward, and we will add to that with inflation as we do with other things. That's key, as I said. The other thing I wanna say is, you can't have democracy when you have one of the major parties struggling to destroy it. So the Republican Party, nationally, and I'm afraid to say in Vermont, is actively trying to destroy democracy. So they just, in Vermont, waived their rule against having a convicted felon be their nominee for president in Vermont. They had that in their bylaws. They waived it for Donald Trump. That tells you everything you need to know, even about what's going on here with the Republican Party. Getting back to the theme of the branches of government, uh, the judicial branches 
really crucial to protecting our democracy. And we may not be able to do much about the Supreme Court, but the judiciary uh, here in Vermont is very important. And I was really thankful to be able to serve on the Judicial Retention Committee. This is a committee that looks at all of the judges who are coming up to be retained, which means to continue doing their work or not. And that was really critical work looking at the what they had, you know, their record, what they had done. Um, they also wrote a little bit on some of their, their own um, work. And we also got to see some of the surveys that had been taken by folks who interacted with them in court. And that w that's a job that I take really seriously. And I think it's crucial to make sure that we get judges who are um, you know, true to anti-bias um, work and anti-bias training and who understand their own privilege and understand that when they are in the courtroom, they have to be focused on equity, they have to be focused on inclusion. Um, and so I, I wanted to just, you know, mention that as something. And then just grassroots, like we cannot underestimate the importance of sitting down with one another and having conversations and agreeing to disagree. And that's okay, dissension and disagreement is part of democracy. We need to be able to have conversations and not always agree with each other, and that's okay. But we have to do it respectfully and we have to do it in a way that that really embraces our differences. Um, that is one of the beauties of democracy. I lived in Eastern Europe as the Soviets were, were departing, and I, I got a good look at what, what it's like to live in um, a society that is, not, that is not open and is not democratic, and I do not want to go back there. Thank you. Thank you. So we have about 10 minutes before we need to move to our closing statements. Our candidates have been very efficient tonight. Um, so we do have a little bit of time to open it up to audience questions if anybody would like to raise a hand and I'll come to you with my mic. Um, and candidates don't feel obligated to all respond to a question, but you all can navigate who, who would like to respond. Uh, hi, I'm Theo Wheeland. I work for the Nurses Union. Uh, I'm a renter, and uh, the cost of housing has been going up uh, my whole life, um, much faster than wages. I'm wondering who here supports rent control? I mean, I'll just say that I think that's absolutely a tool we have to look at when we are looking at stagnated wages, and particularly when we're looking at corporations buying up properties simply for profit. We can't allow people to profit because someone else can't afford to live. And so that is absolutely something that I support. One of the challenges, though, in the State House has been getting any type of tenant protections or rent control passed. I mean, we, could, we haven't been able to even pass charter changes for just cause eviction protection, which is something I have fought for since before I was elected and have continued to fight for. Um, but I, I think that is in, in some part due to how few renters' voices are, are in the chamber. So thank you for, for bringing that into the room. I just, I, I completely agree. Our housing market is completely dysfunctional. Uh, and it's not serving broad swaths of, of the Vermont population. Um, I think we're at, a, we're at a crisis now that is so severe uh, that rents, you know, you're at the mercy of a landlord. Um, and people who would normally move out of a rental apartment can't because there's nothing to buy, much less anything that you could afford to buy, that a bank would give you a mortgage to buy. Uh, this is a huge risk to our state. Um, I would, until we can get our supply, which is A number one to me, where it needs to be, and have some reasonable uh, balance between supply and demand uh, and, a, and a vacancy rate that might not be ideal, but it's not a half a percent, which is where it is now, um, that we could have a, a just cause eviction. Uh, maybe we would sunset it after a while, I don't know. But I'm open to it. Um, I think we're at that point. I think there are other things we can do, such as um, uh, the short-term rental uh, problem, it's, it's exploding. And, and all of those units are units that a nurse at the University of Vermont Medical Center might want to rent. Uh, and that's now taken out of the market, which just puts incredible pressure on a market that's already strained. So there are some levers we can, can pull in Montpelier, but I agree with you. I mean, <laughs> it's fundamental. You need housing, and we're driving people away. Uh, if we don't really get serious about this. 
It appears we're just going down the line, so I'm gonna, I'll jump in. Um, there's a great book called Homelessness is a Housing uh, Issue or a housing problem, um, and our low vacancy rates are causing myriad problems across the board, as has already been mentioned. Um, I would just like to say that I, I've mentioned before that I've lived overseas, and so I've rented in other countries, and it's interesting to compare our systems. Um, sometimes here, I feel as though the rental world is sort of shrouded in mystery. You go into uh, a rental agreement, you're not really sure um, if you're going to come out of it, okay, you're not sure if your rent is going to go up, um, you're, you get a heating bill, you don't know where that's coming from. I've experienced that myself here in Burlington. So um, I, I do think legislation could be a path to help better define the rules around renting and around what it means to be a landlord. Um, if I make it back into the Senate, that's something I would like to work on. I think it's really important to make sure it's not shrouded in mystery and everyone has a clear understanding of what their expectations are going into it. Uh, I do. So um, people will remember back during COVID, we got this massive infusion of federal money. And a lot of what we did with that money was housing related. So at this point, it's getting close to a billion dollars over the last six years that we've put into the housing sector. That's huge, it's unprecedented in Vermont history, but at the same time, the cost of building materials and contractors has risen sharply. So when you look at what we're gonna get for that billion dollars, it's surprisingly small in terms of the number of housing units. So obviously we can't throw enough money at it to, to get at the problem that way. That was part of the thinking behind the modernization of Act 250. So the idea is, if you're in a place in the state where there's already robust zoning and infrastructure, you don't need Act 250 because you've got its effective equivalent already in place. So by lifting that, we hopefully make for more private building. But the problem, as I see it, is ultimately, and this is for renters and would-be homeowners, is the Airbnb model. So we call those kind of tech companies disruptors, right? They come into a place in the economy and they disrupt it the way that Uber disrupted the taxi industry. So Airbnb has completely disrupted our rental economy and, and in some cases our home buying economy. So that's ultimately the fight, is with those big corporations that lobby very effectively now to make sure there are no restrictions on the amount of rental units that can be pulled out of uh, public reach by companies like Airbnb and, and uh, similar organizations. So as far as I'm concerned, that's the fight for the next couple of years is how do we limit short-term rentals because we are a tourist-driven state and we are just for the picking when these companies need uh, tourist rentals. Thank you. And I think, Dan, if you help us keep responses to one minute this time, we have time for one more question, if anybody has. Hi. Um, Mr. Ladderbetter's campaign has received over $3,000 from the Tarrant family, which is a Republican family who has a history of opposing Democrats. How can you be trusted as a Democrat while accepting donations from Republicans, landlords, and the ultra-wealthy? Thanks. I had a feeling... That might come up. Uh, I am super proud of the support that I have received from all sorts of people across our state. I think it shows momentum. As you heard at the outset here, these guys are running together. I'm the, the newcomer. I have never, I'm a first time candidate. And I am humbled uh, whether I was given a little bit or a check from, from the Terrence. I didn't solicit this. It was uh, as a big a surprise to me as it was to anybody else, but it's gonna allow me to communicate directly with Democratic primary voters in the, in the five weeks ahead. Uh, I think you um, have heard me say that, uh, you know, over the course of my career, I uh, was trusted as a journalist. And I think people sort of think they know you and are, are willing to take a chance on a first time candidate um, that they feel that uh, they know. Um, I hope that's the case. I don't know why some of these folks gave me money, um, but I'm going to use it to, to communicate with 
Democratic primary voters in the, in the weeks leading up to this primary. Okay, thank you all. For our final statements, we're gonna start with Senator Vihovsky. And candidates, we are going to open up the floor and give you each two minutes to share with us your concluding thoughts. So what do you want voters to know about you in two minutes, starting with Senator Vihovsky. Thank you. Vermont is, as is most of the nation and maybe the world, at a critical inflection point. There is a confluence of crises reaching a breaking point right now. Climate crises, housing crises, economic crises, healthcare crises. I could go on, but almost every system is reaching a point where it is in crisis. And these issues didn't happen overnight or even in the two years that I've been in the Senate. It took decades of doing what we have always done to get us here. And there isn't going to be a simple, quick, or easy solution. It's going to take collaboration, representation, and some tough conversations and a willingness to lean into the discomfort of trying something new, something innovative, and something different. As a social worker, I'm really well versed in tough conversations and sitting with discomfort. And as a senator, I think I've shown time and again that I'm willing to stand up for what I believe is right, even when it is hard, and in the face of overwhelming odds, I bring with me the life experience of a working class Vermonter who grew up here, who struggled to afford to come back here after college and desperately wants to stay here and is ready to lean in to the discomfort of what I know Vermont can be. We need more innovation to transform Vermont into the Vermont of the future where every one of us can thrive, where every one of our voices is heard, and where it doesn't matter what town we grew up in or how much money we have, we know that our needs will be met. Senator Berth. So we haven't talked about gun safety at all, um, and I do want to finish with that. It's the issue that I've been most closely associated with since I got to Montpelier. In 2013, I put in uh, a bill banning assault weapons, and it created a mini explosion in the State House, and I was pretty much ostracized by all three parties uh, for a period of time. And then something uh, very horrible happened. There were a series of mass shootings around the country, and people in the State House and outside the State House began to agree with my position. And as things went forward, we were able finally to get enough votes in the State House to pass universal background checks, a ban on high capacity magazines, and a whole r r uh, raft of other legislation. So two years ago, I sent out a mailing when I was running and I said, uh, after Uvalde, the massacre in Uvalde, it's time for all of us to recommit to gun safety. And so I said, I won't quit if you won't. And people sent me back. And so in the last two years, we added to the previous list uh, a 72-hour waiting period, a bill um, criminalizing it if you don't lock up your weapon and something happens and someone is injured with it. We call that safe storage. And we expanded uh, extreme risk protection orders so that family members could have weapons taken away if they felt threatened by someone with a gun. There is much more to do, uh, trust me. We are now in the middle of the pack nationally with states in terms of how much legislation and protection we have. We need a ban on assault weapons, and I'm looking very seriously at that for next session. Uh, so that's a heads up. Um, and we'll see where we get with that. Thank you. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the American dream in our country, and I think of myself as a product of that dream. Neither of my parents have college degrees. I, when I was little, I lived in a mobile home. Um, my dad was fortunate to go into the Air Force and receive assistance in buying a home, which allowed us to build wealth. I'm very thankful for um, what I've received from living in this country, in this, in this democracy. Um, we are facing so many challenges in this state. I would like to continue the work that I've already started. 
uh, particularly around education reform. Um, I've been knocking on doors and a lot of folks want to talk about property taxes. They want to talk about education and I'm there for it. I do want to talk about this and I am ready to dig into the hard work and everything needs to be on the table. We have to take a close look at local control. Is that something that we can continue to sustain? We need to look at the number, the number of building, school buildings that we have in this state. Is that sustainable? We also need to think about our private and public uh, schism that we have in this state. It's very hard to navigate two systems, um, and it's certainly not efficient, and it's expensive. So these are all things that I am willing and able and excited to grapple with. Um, the health of our public edu education system is crucial, as many of us have already mentioned tonight. Um, and as we've seen, there are districts that are not passing their school budgets. This is very, very troubling, and we have to face it, and we have to fix it. Um, I would also like to continue my work on the Health and Welfare Committee. We passed some great legislation this year, S-98, which will give the Green Mountain Care Board authority over pharmaceutical drug prices. That is so important because medical costs are breaking our backs right now. We need to deal with that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks to all of you for being here and to Planned Parenthood, Vermont Conservation Voters, the ACLU and VPIRG um, for the first forum of this uh, primary. Uh, you know, I think now where I'm coming from on a range of these issues, uh, so I want to leave you with a little story. Uh, knocking on doors, collecting petition signatures, something I've never done before. Um, you see people face to face in their doorway. And I met a 30-year-old woman at 40th and Allen the other day who was recruited to come to Vermont for a good job at the with the state in marketing. She uh, pays $1,900 a month in rent, and after three years here, is having serious doubts about whether she can stay here or not. She loves Vermont. She loves the whole vibe and the four seasons and the snow and the skiing and all of that, but she has not been able to uh, save much and feels pretty hopeless about her prospects of affording even a condominium or starter home uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, we need her here, and we need thousands of people just like her here, or else this aging state is going to slowly decline. Uh, she powers, and others like her, our economy. She sends income tax revenue to our state that gives Montpelier the money that we need to do all of the programs that we have been talking about here tonight. Uh, it's a critical issue for Vermont's future. Our housing system is broken. It is why it's my number one issue. It also doesn't serve seniors or people with disabilities or those who are in recovery uh, either. Uh, that's why, principally, more than anything else, that's why I'm running. I appreciate you being here. I will do my very best to serve this district and all of the state of Vermont, and I hope to help Vermonters feel a little better about their politics uh, if I'm in the Senate. Please consider me for one of the three seats representing this district on August 13th. Thanks. Thank you. That is all the time we have this evening. A huge, a huge thank you to all of our Senate candidates and to all of you for coming out to listen and participate in our forum tonight, as well as to our partner organizations for producing this engaging evening. Be well, everyone, and remember to vote on August 13th. Thank you.